Wires? Who needs wires? In this video, we're going to be diving into the world of wireless networking. Here we have a couple of laptops and some phones. Now we could connect the laptops using physical cables, but many laptops don't come with ethernet ports anymore, so that won't work. Of course, the phones definitely don't have ethernet ports, so that definitely won't work as well. We may also want our users to move around freely without the need to plug into our network. The solution here is to use a wireless network. So how exactly do we do that? Well, first we need something called a wireless access point, also known as a WAP, or simply NAP. This access point is the center of our wireless network. Our laptops, phones, and other devices will then connect to our access point through the air and form our wireless network. So here we have a very basic wireless network. This is known as a basic service set or BSS. This is where we have an access point connecting multiple devices, which are known as members of the BSS. Now there is a downside to wireless networks like this, and it's one I'm sure you've experienced before at home. When connected to a wireless network, you are restricted to the area the access point has signal for you to connect. And this signal area is known as the basic service area or BSA. Okay, great. So this is what a standalone wireless network looks like. However, most wireless networks will want to connect back to the wired network. The upstream connection from the access point that connects back to the wired network is called the distribution system or DS. Now we can even use different VLANs for separate wireless networks if we want to. For example, we may have a wireless network called Guest, and this is using VLAN 10. We might also have a wireless network called Corporate, which uses VLAN 20. For this to work, we connect our access point to our switch using a trunk port, and the access point will take care of the VLAN tagging. Now let's look a little bit closer at how our devices connect to the wireless network. The access point is periodically advertising the network details using radio waves. These advertisements are called beacon frames. Any device within range is able to see these frames. Beacon frames contain several bits of information, but the two main bits are the basic service set identifier or BSSID and the service set identifier or SSID. The BSSID is a unique identifier for the wireless access point and it's based on the MAC address. You as a user will not see the BSSID, but it's important for our devices to identify the correct access point. The next piece of information is the SSID. Now the SSID is something I'm sure you've seen and used before. It's essentially the wireless network name. So when you go into a coffee shop, hotel, or even a friend's house, and you ask them what is the Wi-Fi, that name that they give you is the SSID. So with this information, our devices can connect to the wireless network. Now in a coffee shop or your friend's house, this wireless network might be big enough. For bigger wireless networks, however, we often need to extend our wireless network using multiple access points. When we use multiple access points like this, it's called an extended service set. In an extended service set, each access point will have a unique BSSID to identify the device. The same SSID, however, can be used on multiple access points to extend the range of the wireless network. This allows the user to roam from access point to access point without needing to reconnect. This appears to the user as a single seamless network. Okay, great, so now we have the basics down. Let's talk about how we can actually send data wirelessly through the air. The way our devices can talk to each other without the need for physical cables is by using electromagnetic waves. This works by sending an alternating current into an antenna, which creates magnetic fields that propagate out as waves. If we take a close look at these waves, we can see that they go up and down, up, and down, up, and down. These are called cycles. Each time a wave returns to its starting point, this is one cycle. It's common to measure these cycles when the wave goes up, down, and back to the start. 
just as you can see here. We measure wireless frequencies in hertz. A single hertz means one cycle per second. So in this example, we have four cycles within one second. One, two, three, and four. This means this example has a frequency of four hertz. Now hertz is actually quite a small measurement. So instead, we can also use kilohertz, which is 1000 hertz, megahertz, which is 1 million hertz, and gigahertz, which is 1 billion hertz. These electromagnetic frequencies have a lot of different uses. If we look at this table, we can see the radio frequencies measured in hertz, as well as some examples of their uses. Radio frequencies range from 3 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. You have probably heard of radio frequencies before. Things such as radio and TV use radio frequencies. This is also where the wireless networking frequencies are. As we can see from this table, each use is separated by using a different frequency range, which are called bands. Wireless uses two main frequency bands, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Now, just to make things a bit more complicated, these bands are then split into separate channels. If we look at the 2.4 gigahertz band, which is actually 2.400 to 2.4835 gigahertz, we can see that it's split into different channels. The reason we use channels is to split the wireless bands into smaller, more manageable pieces, allowing us to control things like congestion and interference. The 2.4 GHz band has 14 channels. However, a lot of these overlap, which can cause interference. So instead, it is recommended to use channels 1, 6 and 11 to avoid any problems. This is because these channels do not overlap with each other, minimizing any interference. The 5 GHz band, as we can see here, does not have the issue of overlapping channels. So why do we care about frequencies and channels? Well, you're going to need to choose which band and which channel you will be using. Generally speaking, the choice comes down to 2.4 GHz, which has a longer reach but slower speeds. It also is usually a bit more congested by other devices. 5 GHz has a shorter reach but can use faster speeds. Now, when looking at different channels, this only really matters if you have multiple access points or multiple wireless networks close by. If you only have one, then any channel will work. When there are multiple wireless networks within range, this is when interference can occur. So it's best to choose a separate, non-overlapping channel. Okay, so that was a lot of information. Everything we just looked at is part of the IEEE standard 802.11. Now, as wireless technologies has evolved and improved over time, amendments have been made to the 802.11 standard. Here you can see the amendments and the characteristics for each. You may have seen these before if you've ever purchased a home router. It's important to note that for two devices to talk to each other, they both need to support the same amendments. Luckily, devices can be compatible with multiple amendments, so you shouldn't run into any problems. So before we finish this video, I just want to quickly go over some other wireless modes that our access points can operate in. First, let's look at repeaters. Repeaters do exactly what they say on the tin. They receive a signal from an access point and then repeat that signal in order to extend the wireless coverage. It's not always possible to run additional cables to add another access point. So in these situations, we can use repeaters instead. Next, we have workgroup bridges. Workgroup bridges act as wireless clients to a wireless access point. They can then connect a wired device to that wireless network. So why would you want to do that? Well, for example, say we have a printer or a PC that does not support wireless connections. We can then use a wired connection to that workgroup bridge, which would then in turn connect to the wireless network. Quick note here, there are two types you might encounter. Universal workgroup bridges. This is the 802.11 standard and only allows one wired device to be bridged to a wireless network. 
Workgroup Bridge is Cisco's own version allowing multiple devices to connect. The next mode is Outdoor Bridges. Outdoor bridges are used to connect two remote networks over a long distance. For example, you may have two office buildings that you want to connect, but it's not possible to lay any cables, maybe because there's a busy road or like a river or something like that in between. In this case, you can use outdoor bridges with specially focused antennas to connect networks over a long distance. It's like running a really long ethernet cable, but through the air. This is known as a point to point outdoor bridge, but you can also have point to multi point outdoor bridges where more than one remote site connects back to the main network. So the last one to talk about is mesh mode. When you have a very large area to provide wireless coverage for, it's not always possible to connect every access point via cables back to the wired network. So instead we can use mesh mode to daisy chain multiple access points together. The way this works is each access point will have two radios. One will use a channel to backhaul client traffic from the access point back to the wireless network. And the other will use a channel to maintain that basic service set network. This creates a seamless wireless network across large areas. This video is part of the full CCNA course, which you can find in the description below. Okay, so that is it for wireless networks. Frequencies, cycles, and Hertz can be intimidating at first, but the concepts are pretty straightforward if you stick with it. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, leave a comment and subscribe. Support from you guys really helps this channel grow. Other than that, thank you for watching.